Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Repronym course. My name is Raul Gonzalez. I'm a professor of psychology at Florida International University. I am also co-PI of the FIU site for ABCD, along with Dr. Angela Laird. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank um, the developers of this workshop, Drs. Kennedy and Laird, and all of the folks involved in making it happening for inviting me to present to all of you. Today, I will be talking about culture and environment assessments from ABCD. The learning objectives for this lecture, to describe the rationale and guiding principles for CNE assessment protocol test selection. I'll also be listing the domains and instruments that constitute the CNE assessment protocol. I'll summarize CNE measures and differences between higher and lower risk participants of the ABCD study across measurement waves. And I'll also discuss some challenges and future directions of the CNE components of the ABCD study. The idea here is really to give you an overview of the measures that make up the culture and environment uh, part of ABCD so that you can feel more comfortable working with these variables and also to let you in a little bit on some of the decision making processes that guided the selection of these variables and why they were included within the ABCD protocol. This is the ABCD data info and acknowledgement, which I'm sure you've all seen plenty by now. I'm sure you've all taken it in, so I'll move on to the next slide. So part of the reason why I am, am presenting on the culture and environment protocol is because I have the privilege of co-chairing the culture and environment work group with Dr. Bob Zucker. This is a list of all of the very valuable culture and environment work group members that have worked uh, at some point within the culture and environment work group to help develop these measures. As you can see, it consists of site PIs, co-investigators, some postdocs, officials from NIH, we have representation from NIAAA, NIMHD, NIDA, and the National Endowments of the Arts. And we also have uh, recently been joined by a couple of research assistants from some of uh, the other sites as well. Um, it's a great group and I wanna thank them all for all the work that they've done over the last few years uh, to get the CNE protocol to where it is today. I'm gonna start by just sharing a little bit of the general rationale and guiding principles that the CNE work group used to choose content areas and measure selection. And this was a very challenging task, mainly because of uh, a bullet point that's there in the middle, which is very brief. The ABCD study, as you know, is incredibly ambitious. There are uh, many different content areas that we are trying to assess. It's a longitudinal study where it's critical for us to retain our participants and give them a very positive experience while they are participating in the protocol. And one way to do that is by making sure that they are not overburdened. Um, each visit is uh, lengthy. The visits that include neuroimaging are even lengthier. And we wanna make sure that all the various broad content areas that are part of ABCD are addressed. So these guiding principles were constrained to a large part by the fact that we had 10 minutes uh, of time allotted for the CNE measures at baseline for the youth and another 10 minutes for their caregiver. With that in mind, the measures needed to be developmentally appropriate, the baseline assessment needed to be feasible and valid for nine to 10 year olds, and it needs to capture emerging youth behaviors and trends. We needed to use valuable, valid and reliable measures amenable to longitudinal assessment, preferably across adolescence. Data harmonization with other lar large scale studies was desirable. So we wanted to rely on measures that were used in other large scale studies and to use measures from the Phoenix toolkit when possible. The content areas for measures having to do with culture and the cultural environment. Um, we strove for them to be measures that would be applicable to a very diverse population that's represented within ABCD. Within the cultural domain, there tend to be many measures that are focused on just one um, ethnic group, racial group, cultural group. So we wanted to do um, as much as possible to use measures that would be as inclusive as possible across a variety of uh, different backgrounds um, of folks that would be participating in ABCD. 
Did I mention that it had to be very brief and we had 10 minutes for youth and 10 minutes for caregivers at baseline? I think I did. Um, and then very important is to uh, stay centered and focus on the original aims of ABCD. ABCD has continued to evolve and grow in many, many positive ways. But the original um, goals of ABCD are as listed below, to establish how diverse patterns of substance use impact the structure and function of the developing brain, to identify the impact of substance use on health, psychosocial development, neural cognition, academic achievement, motivation, and emotional regulation. And also understanding how SU and addiction affect the onset, course, and severity of psychopathology and vice versa, including the role of disruptive behavior disorders. To identify factors that influence trajectories of substance use and its consequences, and to establish how use of one substance contributes to use of other substances. So a lot of the decision-making around measures were um, relying on literature for things that are very relevant to the development of substance use disorders in youth, even though obviously the measures that we ended up selecting are relevant way well beyond just substance use. Um, a, a big part of what led us to choose many of the measures that we did was because of prior literature on their importance in substance use trajectories, particularly during adolescence. So let me tell you a little bit about the demographics of ABCD. You've probably seen uh, some of this already. In the upper left, you'll see the baseline demographics for ABCD within each of the various categories that you see there. The number on the right was the original target, and the number on the left is the proportion of individuals within that classification that ABCD actually managed to enroll. And I think overall, we did pretty well. It might be obvious, but I, what I want to point out here is how different the social demographics also are across sites. In the upper right are the demographics for the FIU site. FIU is located in Miami, which it has a very large uh, Hispanic Latinx population. And that is reflected in the numbers um, and our recruitment. Also, um, you know, you can't see it here, but sites, for example, like SRI in San Francisco, you know, family income tends to be much higher. Down in the lower left, you can see a little bit of a distribution of the proportion of participants in various sites based on family income. You can look at FIU in the right, and you can see that FIU tends to have many individuals participating in the study of lower income. And um, you compare that to sites like University of Michigan or Utah, which have a somewhat more affluent um, population that they're drawing from. On the right, you can also see um, differences in educational attainment. You see a site like the Utah site, which has a very large proportion of individuals that have obtained bachelor's degrees, compared to sites um, like UCSD, FIU, um, that have a uh, lower amount of individuals that have attained um, higher education you know, beyond a, a high school and an associate's degree. So we needed to try to come up with measures that would work across these very, very different uh, sets of communities. This is um, to remind me to mention to all of you that in its attempt to be as inclusive as possible, uh, we wanted to make the protocol uh, applicable to uh, large swaths of the U.S. population. Um, and we have a very large portion of the U.S. population where um, particularly parents of youth, especially if they're coming from a community with a large immigrant population from um, Mexico, Central America, South America, other Spanish-speaking countries where the parents are not fluent in English. And um, we thought that it was feasible enough to, and especially with the, the availability of some measures already in Spanish, to be able to modify the parent protocol to be able to be administered in Spanish. So for the youth, it wasn't possible to translate all of the youth measures as well and find valid measures for the youth. So a requirement for participating in ABCD was the youth being able to uh, speak and communicate and understand English well, but that was not necessary for the parents. And as you can see, 5% of the entire ABCD sample, the parents opted to complete their measures in um, Spanish. So this is just, again, attesting to the diversity of that sample. But this doesn't really do it justice. One of the measures that we um, administer the participants, which I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more, uses uh, speaking of another language as a proxy for acculturation. And we ask individuals if they spoke another language. And these are all of the languages that individuals endorsed at baseline as uh, second languages. 
that they speak. So as you can see, we have, uh, considering that this is a national study, uh, we have individuals participating in ABCD from all sorts of different uh, cultural uh, backgrounds. So with that in mind, what um, this is a, a somewhat artificial uh, classification of the types of domains that the measures that we picked within the 10 minutes um, allotted to us uh, fell in. So there are measures on cultural factors, things like cultural practices, acculturation, biculturalism, cultural values like self-reliance, familism, religiosity that seem to vary across different cultures, ethnic and racial identity, and measures of discrimination. In terms of the proximal environment, we have things on neighborhood and community environment. So questions about crime, safety, community cohesion, the school environment, support, safety, engagement, grades, and then the family and social environment, which include things like positive relationships between the parent and child, parental awareness of the child's activities, family conflict, cohesion, involvement in various uh, recreational and cultural activities, and things like peer influence. So I think we managed to get a lot of important things in, um, in the time that was made uh, available. And each and every single one of these things have been found to be associated either in a risk or resilience way with substance use trajectories, but not just substance use trajectories, also um, mental health and uh, academic achievement. So we think you know, in, our, in our choosing of these variables, we thought that these would give us a lot of, you know, quote unquote, bang for the buck. Here you see a summary of the specific measures that were a part of the protocol. And on the right, in green, it means that they were administered at that visit. And in red, it means that they were not. So as you can see, uh, the uh, measures that we've been using have, have grown um, over time. At baseline, the youth, um, it took them about eight minutes to complete the measures that we had selected. At the one year follow-up, we added some measures. It took them nine minutes to complete. And then there were additional measures added and some taken out um, that brought the visit up to 15 minutes by the two-year follow-up. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the principles guiding the bringing a measure in or taking a measure out in a bit. You can imagine the spirited and lengthy discussions that a work group like this would have in deciding what goes in and, and what comes out. This is um, the measures for the parents. And you can also see that the parent protocol for culture and environment, thankfully, also uh, grew in the amount of time that we had allotted with about 10 minutes at baseline and then 15 minutes by the two year follow up. And I will go through each of these measures um, as part of this presentation. This is just to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of when the measures were administered and the pattern of administration from baseline to two year follow up. So what was some of the rationale that informed changes in our work group uh, in terms of what measures get included or dropped or skipped over time? We tried to aim for consistency. This is a longitudinal study. We're trying to get longitudinal data and look at trajectories and patterns and examine change over time. It's one of the wonderful things about the ABCD data. So anytime a measure was uh, skipped or taken out, um, this was something that always weighs heavily on us. We tried to aim for simplicity over complexity, especially starting out with a baseline sample that was nine to 10 years old. There's some measures that are uh, very complex. All of our measures are administered via uh, REDCap with some exceptions. So we wanna uh, keep things uh, simple to make it as um, user-friendly as possible and uh, minimize burden for our participants. We needed to consider typical developmental changes. There may be some constructs that were very important at one point in time that may be less important later and vice versa. Also, there may be things that we just need a one-time snapshot um, and then you know, a, a, a re-examination of these things later. So we have to consider what typical development is when certain behaviors come online, when certain factors may be more or less influential. And this ties into considering the emerging youth behaviors and trends. We know certain behaviors tend to emerge at certain ages, so we wanna make sure that we uh, time things to be able to maximize the, 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 the breadth of the measures that we administered um, with uh, when we thought that we would be able to pick up a signal on certain behaviors uh, among the youth given their age. We need to consider also emerging scientific information. This is a living study. You know, we start at a particular point in time. Science is always changing. So we have to, again, balance some of these changes and emerging trends and perhaps new measures and constructs or new information with the longitudinal nature of the study and our desire for consistency. We also tried to cover constructs at one point that we were not able to fit at a prior time point. 
it may be that we had certain measures that did not need to be administered at every visit, and it was enough to administer them every other visit, allowing another measure that we had not been able to previously administer um, in, into the, the protocol. I've mentioned uh, over and over again about the importance of minimizing the burdens for our families. And we also did this in part uh, by minimizing the number of new and additional platforms. It may be that bringing in a new measure that someone was very excited about also meant bringing in a whole new platform into ABCD. And we tried to avoid that whenever possible. There were times when we had to violate some of these principles because of the importance of a particular construct that we wanted to assess. But these things were always considered um, as these decisions were being made. Okay, so now we get to the part where I will describe uh, briefly the measures that were included um, in the battery. So for uh, I'm starting out with the measures that fall within the uh, what we're calling the cultural domain. For youth, there was only one measure administered at this time, and that's the Phoenix acculturation measure. We thought it important to get some measure of acculturation in quickly so that we could track um, changes in acculturation with the youth, especially considering that there is a, um, a, a sizable portion of individuals within the study who are somewhat uh, recent uh, immigrants and those that live in either communities or households that practice a vast um, array of cultural practices, both from whatever their heritage cultures uh, may be, um, and then also um, other cultures as well. So this measure is an incredibly brief measure. It's really a measure of what language an individual speaks and who they speak it with. It's not necessarily a, a, a very robust measure of acculturation, but it was, um, it was brief and it would let us uh, get a little glimpse into this uh, both with the youth and we could administer it to both the youth and the caregiver, which would also allow us to be able to track differences in rates of acculturation between youth and parents and um, what impact that may have on other outcomes uh, of relevance to ABCD. With the caregivers, especially considering that things like ethnic identity are much more developed um, in individuals you know, well older than nine to 10, uh, that don't, these things don't necessarily uh, emerge to a large extent into, into later adolescence, the parents had, had many more measures um, of, of culture than the youth. So in addition to the Phoenix acculturation, we also administered the Vancouver Index of Acculturation. And this measure was originally developed uh, in Canada for assessment with a variety of uh, immigrant populations in Canada. And one of the reasons why we like this measure within the work group was it, it was because it, it allowed for a um, orthogonal classification of how much one is involved in activities from their heritage culture versus kind of you know typical common uh, American activities that aren't associated with uh, an individual's heritage culture. And this allows one to capture information on biculturalism. Other measures of acculturation often have you pick, you know, either this culture or that culture and don't necessarily let you rate both. This measure allowed you to rate both. So for example, one item might be, you know, I enjoy entertainment, for example, movies and music from my heritage culture, and that's rated. And then another item might be, I enjoy other American entertainment, for example, you know, other movies and music. Um, for this instrument, individuals self-select whether they want to uh, take this instrument or not. They themselves identify uh, their heritage culture with some examples being given, or they can identify that they don't identify with any other culture um, other than American. And, um, and they can opt out of taking this, um, this instrument as well. Uh, I don't, I'm not showing you this data today, but there is a vast array of self-identified um, cultures that uh, families endorsed. I failed to mention that for the Phoenix acculturation, the, the most important questions in there, there are many other questions about what language they speak and how proficient they are, but there's also questions about, the important question is what language do you speak most with your family and what language do you speak most with your friends? Um, and that um, the discrepancy between those will let you know a little bit more about acculturation over time. The next measure for the parents was the multi-group ethnic identity measure, which is a commonly used measure of ethnic identity. Questions on this measure include things like, I have a strong sense of belonging to my ethnic group, and I feel a strong attachment toward my own ethnic group, among others. And many of these measures have additional subscales. The Mexican-American cultural value scale, even though it's titled Mexican-American, really covers uh, a couple of uh, values that are uh, relevant to some of the outcome measures within uh, ABCD, but aren't necessarily just specific to Mexican-American participants. So these include things like uh, family support, family unity, religiosity, independent self-reliance, um, that are constructs that might be relevant for, for other uh, behaviors. And then, um, you know, the one exception about trying to pick measures that would be 
appropriate for everybody was the Native American acculturation scale. There was a lot of interest in uh, making sure that um, there is a large proportion of a non, um, there, there's, there's a, a, a significant proportion of Native American participants given the location of some of the sites within ABCD. And given the um, historic lack of research within um, Native communities, it was uh, important to also capture specific information about Native American acculturation. So these were asked of the parent, and it was only if a parent identified, um, if, if they identified that the youth had at least one Native American parent or a parent who identifies as Native American. And these include questions like, what contact did your child's Native American parent have with Native American communities? Does your family participate? in Native American traditions, ceremonies, and, and so on. Now I'm just gonna discuss a little bit kind of what changes were made, what measures were added and taken out at the one year and two year follow-up. For the youth, we added a measure of perceived discrimination. These drew from items from two different scales. Uh, Boston Youth Survey included some items and then also the Finney Perceived Discrimination Scale. The items that were brought in from the Boston Youth Survey were brought in because of how uh, broadly they assess discrimination. It wasn't just ethnic racial discrimination. It also assessed things like discrimination based on sexual identity, based on body um, image, um, and also um, uh, immigration status. Um, so this asked questions, you know, in the last 12 months, have you felt discriminated against because of your race, ethnicity, or color, because your family is from another country? Um, and then the Finney has items like, I don't feel accepted by other uh, Americans. So this lets us know about how much uh, discrimination is being perceived by our participants. And this was given to the youth. For the caregiver, in order to um, adapt to changes in the battery, uh, we did not think it necessary to administer the Vancouver Index of Acculturation again at the one-year follow-up, but you can see that we administered again at the two-year follow-up. And the Phoenix acculturation continues to be administered at every visit, both of the parent and, and the youth. At the two-year follow-up, we now started asking the youth also just the items around family uh, support and unity within the Mexican-American cultural values scale. And this is now being asked of the youth and the parent, which this will also allow us to look at discrepancies and divergence or convergence in values between the youth and the family as they move through adolescence and then um, things that are associated with, with that. Now I'm gonna to move to the next domain, which is the proximal environment. You know, for youth, we had a very brief questionnaire called uh, for neighbor of Neighborhood Crime and Safety from Phoenix. Um, and this is just a simple question. My neighborhood is safe from crime with multiple choices. And then Phoenix uh, school risk and protective factors, which really uh, also was a little bit of a homebrew measure where we brought in items for, for multiple measures. And this really asks about the school environment. Things like I get along with my teacher, Usually school bores me um, and what the environment in the school is like. And then for the caregiver, we also ask about neighborhood safety and crime. I also want to point out that there, there is a um, whole other work group within ABCD that's focused on geolocation data and um, environmental data, uh, data driven um, from the perspective of um, what the environment looks like, things like number of liquor stores, poverty within a zip code, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So these measures within the CNE work group, which are self-report, help to also add a little bit more um, color, if you will, and data um, to what may be brought in from the, um, the geolocation group. Within this domain, for the one-year follow-up for the youth, we added a measure that we were not able to administer at baseline that has been found to be related to all sorts of substance use trajectories in youth overdevelopment, which is the Will's Problem sol Solving Scale. This asks things um, about planfulness in the youth. When I have a problem at school or at home, I get as much information as I can. They rate those items. I think of different ways to take care of it. They rate those items. And for the caregiver, there were no changes. At two-year follow-up for the youth, we then skipped the Will's Problem Solving Scale, so we're only gonna capture that periodically. And we added an instrument for school attendance and grades. We are collecting school records and getting permission to collect school records from um, our parents, but we have not been able to, the researchers have not been available to do that. So we're asking for self-report data uh, for school attendance and grades. And we ask that of the youth, and we also ask that of the caregiver. For the caregiver, we also added uh, another instrument called the Phoenix Community Cohesion Instrument, which draws from items from multiple uh, large-scale studies. And this asks about how close a community is and how much social control is exerted in a community. Questions like, this is a close-knit neighborhood. People around here are willing to help their neighbors. And then finally, from the family social domain, um, for the youth, at baseline, we administer the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire Pro-Social Behavior Subscale, which asks about 
prosocial behavior. This is the youth talking about their own behavior. And this has things like, I try to be nice to other people. I care about their feelings. Parental monitoring. How often do your parents or guardians know where you are? So the youth self-report on a variety of um, parental monitoring items. And it includes things like even, you know, does your family get together to eat dinner together at night? Uh, child's report of parental behavior inventory acceptance subscale. This is about uh, the child rating their parent on how nurturing and accepting they are. So this has questions like my caregiver is a person who smiles at me very often, is easy to talk to, and the participants rate um, these items. And then the family environment scale, family conflict subscale, which assesses family conflict. We fight a lot in our family. Family members rarely become openly angry. Obviously, that second one would be reverse scored. And then for the caregiver, we have them also rate the youth on uh, pro-social behavior. So this is their uh, report of the youth's pro-social behavior, in addition to the youth's own self-report. And the caregiver also completes the family environment scale, family conflict uh, subscale. In terms of changes that happened at the one-year and two-year follow-up, within this domain, at the one-year follow-up, there were no changes for the youth and the caregiver. At the two-year follow-up for the youth, we skipped the CRPBI acceptance uh, subscale items, and we added the peer behavior profile. Now, as the youth are engaging more and more uh, and being influenced more and more by their peers, and uh, peer influence becomes a, a much more relevant factor. So for the peer behavior profile, it taps um, into three domains, pro-social activity, school achievement, and rule breaking. And it asks how many of your friends are athletes, have skipped school, have shoplifted occasionally. And we also added peer network health, uh, which is an instrument that asks about um, pro-social behaviors encouraged by peers. So for example, during the last six months, have any of your close friends ever suggested that you not use drugs or alcohol? And there are other similar items like this also about how willing your friends are to help you in a variety of other um, behaviors uh, or situations. For the caregiver at the two-year follow-up, we added additional scales from the family um, environment, additional subscales from the family environment scales. So in addition to family conflict, we also now ask about family cohesion, expressiveness within the family, intellectual cultural activities in the family, active recreational activities in the family, and how organized the family environment is. So now I'm gonna shift to um, the last portion of the talk which is to present some data on the uh, CNE measures across the various measurement waves um, in terms of how they relate to uh, a very specific criterion. Um, this may have been discussed in, in one of the prior reprogram uh, measures, but at, at the onset of the study, uh, the ABCD study sought out to recruit a sufficiently high amount of higher risk youth in order to maximize the opportunity to capture less typical but important health affecting behaviors like substance use. Most of the youth in our study are not going to be illicit substance users. Uh, they're probably not even gonna really start using substances until uh, kind of midway through the study. These behaviors have low base rates in the general population. Luckily, the ABC study has a very large sample size, but it's typical to kind of seed the sample with more of these high-risk behaviors that one is interested in to make sure that there are enough uh, youth that exhibit these behaviors over the course of the study to conduct meaningful data analysis. So there was um, a set of analyses that were developed and was uh, published on where several individuals associated with ABCD tried to come up with a, a set of uh, simple brief questions that could be asked at screening that might uh, help us classify an individual as higher risk. And the aim was originally to recruit around 50% of youth for this higher risk group. The remainder of the sample was just referred to as lower risk. The criterion for determining higher risk was um, marijuana use by age 14 and 15. And this data came from four other uh, sets of longitudinal data, other studies that have been concluded, to be able to develop and validate this brief screening instrument. So the final set of items uh, included both externalizing and internalizing factors, as well as parental nicotine use. And I encourage folks to read the paper if they're interested in this. Um, the externalizing factors were much more predictive of the substance use. But given emerging evidence for the importance of internalizing factors also being relevant to a variety of health behaviors during adolescence, internalizing items were added um, as well. So a participant was considered as higher risk um, if they met high risk for either internalizing or externalizing or both based on parent report. This included things like the parent endorsing disobedience at school, the child lying or cheating, destroying things, stealing, and then the parental tobacco use in the household. Internalizing behaviors were things like uh, being fearful and anxious, sad or depressed, physical problems without a known medical cause, sort making friends, 
and finding life to be stressful. And at the end, ABCD did end up recruiting about 50% of youth that fell in the higher risk and 50% of youth that fell in the lower risk. But um, our criteria were sufficiently uh, relaxed where uh, there was no need to uh, exclude participants from the study to be able to reach the 50-50 target. So these higher risk youth are certainly not the kind of more extreme, um, more, the, the most extreme sort of um, risk behaviors that one could, could imagine. But for the purposes of doing some preliminary analyses, given that a lot of the behaviors that we're interested in haven't really emerged to a large extent in the youth yet in the study, this uh, higher risk or lower risk has been something that we've used within the CNU work group to see how youth might differ on some of the measures from within uh, our work group. So uh, there's a lot of data here. I know uh, all of you will have these slides and you'll be able to uh, look at them at your leisure and we'll be able to ask questions about these when we meet. So um, I'm not gonna cover each and everything that's in there, but I'll just say that uh, as you can see, not every measure has the full sample. Those are the measures where individuals were gated. So for acculturation, if somebody didn't speak another language, they wouldn't complete the acculturation measure. And for example, in the VIA, if somebody didn't identify some sort of familial or heritage culture, they were, uh, other, other than uh, just American, they um, were uh, not administered those items either. So you can see uh, the impact of that with the sample size. And also we got a really nice range and distribution of scores um, across the various measures. But I want to draw your attention all the way to the right. Um, what this shows is the odds ratio of being in the higher or lower risk group. All of the ones in blue were significant and the ones that were not um, are, are in black. So I'll just very briefly go through this. Um, they're all in the direction that we won't expect. Safer neighborhoods was associated with being in the lower risk group. Better school environment and more school involvement also with lower risk. School disengagement with higher risk. Um, an, an accepting and nurturing parent was associated with lower risk. More family conflict, higher risk. Parental monitoring, more parental monitoring, lower risk, and more prosocial behavior self-report on the youth with lower risk. For the parent, um, engaging in activities of either the heritage culture or the quote-unquote mainstream American culture, um, you can see that both were associated with uh, the child being in the lower risk group. One of the ethnic identity um, subscales uh, came up as well. Uh, strong family support was associated with being in the lower risk group. A little bit more uh, independence and self-reliance was a little bit associated more with being in the higher risk group. Neighborhood safety, safe, safer neighborhoods, lower risk, more family conflict, higher risk, and the parent report of more pro-social behaviors in the youth, also lower risk. So this uh, lends some validity to the inclusion of these measures because even with these uh, screening questions, at baseline, when the youth were nine to 10, we're already seeing some differentiation based on these measures. Now, the other ones that are not significant, that's fine as well. A lot of these measures like acculturation and uh, participation in cultural heritage items were always thought to be more of potential mediators and moderators and models that, of, of other behaviors uh, and not necessarily being like direct predictors of, of some of the behaviors. So we'll see when other data emerges. You can see uh, very similar results for the one year. All the things that were significant remain significant. All the things that were, were not. The effect sizes are of comparable magnitude. Same thing I didn't get for that. the... Same thing for the, for the two-year. Uh, you may have just heard Siri activating herself based on, on something I said. Uh, hopefully she won't, she won't talk again. She's always listening. Um, okay, so two-year, a uh, very similar pattern, same uh, measures significant, and uh, very similar effect sizes. Uh, now I'm gonna show you, these analyses that I, that I just showed you were just univariate analyses with just the single measure predicting higher or lower risk. I'm not gonna show you the results. Um, after controlling for social demographic variables within ABCD, age, biological sex, race or ethnicity, parental education, and household income. So um, the colors in blue are just uh, showing significance from the univariate tests kind of being brought over to, to this table. The next column over, uh, instead of showing you odds ratio, shows you an R-square for the univariate model. The next column over shows you the R-square for the model that includes both the social demographic covariates and that individual measure from the CNU workgroup. The next column over is just to show you how much variance was accounted for by a model that only included the covariates. And then the last column shows you the R-square for a model that included both um, all of the social demographic variables together and all of the youth CNU measures together and all of the parent measures together. And what you can see here is that the social demographic factors accounted for about two to 3% of the variance in whether someone was higher or lower risk. And when um, you add the youth c &E measures, the amount of variance accounted for doubles from about 2% to 4%. For the parent measures, it's even more. 
just with the social demographic factors, we're accounting for about 2% of the variance in higher and lower risk. You add all of the CNE measures and that goes up to about 9% of the variance. And that increase in variance is significant. For the one year, you see a similar uh, increase, 2% with the social demographic covariates only to about 4.5% when you add in the CNE measures. And for the parent measures, the same, about 2% going up to about 8%. And I got to tell you, 8% variance, um, as you may have already seen in other talks with the ABCD data, is uh, a, a nice chunk of variance. Um, so for the two-year, we're still seeing a similar pattern from about 2 to 3% with the social demographic covariance only, up to about 4.5%. And across the board, we're seeing the parent report being more uh, relevant to the higher versus lower risk. Of course, it was parent report that was used to classify somebody as higher versus lower risk. And these higher and lower risk classifications are not the end-all be-all of ABCD. This is not a group mean comparison study um, or a, an analysis of higher versus lower risk. The study is a dynamic study looking at change over time and trajectories, but this starts giving us a little bit of a peek as to um, perhaps the value of some of these measures in um, ultimately predicting some of these behaviors. And there have been papers that have been coming out that make use of a lot of the measures from the culture and environment work group that have revealed very interesting um, interactions and effects with some of these variables and the neuroimaging variables, as well as the neurocognitive variables. Um, and I'm sure as our data analysis uh, becomes continually more and more sophisticated and we have more uh, data of change over time, these variables we brought in together to um, flesh things out a little bit more and understand a little bit more about uh, risk and resilience factors and individual differences in, in why one youth that may be similar on a certain number of factors might end up with a very different outcome than another youth. So we're hoping that these will help um, shed some light on, on uh, these issues. Uh, I now want to wrap up by talking a little bit about what lies ahead. So for the three-year follow-up and the four-year follow-up, we already have these uh, batteries down. Um, they're already being uh, administered. The four-year follow-up started recently. For the three-year follow-up, we started. We added new measures for the youth, including the Vancouver Index of Acculturation, the multi-group ethnic identity measure. Um, we now are uh, adding the scales that were not administered in the last round, religion and independent self-reliance, both for the youth and um, the parents are getting that again. There was the addition of a question about pet ownership, just a single item question uh, about, about pets. Um, there was an addition of a uh, retrospective self-report of neglectful parenting behaviors um, that uh, you know, we didn't have in other areas. There, there are uh, other you know, adverse events that are uh, calculated in ABCD. This is the youth self-report of neglectful behaviors at an earlier age. For the caregiver, there were no new additions for the three-year follow-up. At the four-year follow-up for the youth, we um, incorporated uh, the measure of resistance to peer influence uh, from Larry Steinberg with some modifications. And for the caregiver, uh, we're asking them a little bit more about what they do in terms of parental monitoring and soliciting information from the youth. And these changes, of course, are driven by the age of the participants um, as they move through the study and the importance of some of these constructs based on prior literature. There are many other constructs that have been debated, talked about, thought about including, not including uh, within the culture and environment protocol. Uh, some of them have been taken up by other work groups. Um, some of them we're trying to include. Of course, the issue is when you bring something new into the protocol, something has to be taken out. Um, and we have all of those other guiding principles that we mentioned previously, an important one of which is consistency. Uh, so things about like romantic relationships, uh, click structures, unpredictability of the fi family environment, impaired driving, ecological activity, space data, uh, more cultural ethnic identity items from the youth that are just starting to be collected, uh, home responsibilities, connections with adults outside the home, like role models, participation in enrichment programs, spirituality in the family. And then of course, outside of this work group, there's a whole set of kind of COVID related items that have were added to ABCD given um, this very unusual year that uh, all of the ABCD investigative team and our participants have experienced together with uh, very different experiences at very at, at different sites. Um, with this, I'd like to summarize the uh, ABCD study cultural environment work group has curated several brief and valid measures of youth's family, peer, proximal, and cultural environment. These measures are chosen to inform important developmental changes that occur during adolescence, as well as additional factors that may moderate or mediate associations with other elements of ABCD. Measures that have been shown important for substance use trajectories and those that have been used in other large scale studies were prioritized. 
Preliminary analyses of the CNE measures show that many account for unique variants in the initial risk classifications of ABCD participants and will likely prove useful for better understanding the many factors that contribute to substance use trajectories, mental health, brain development, and functional outcomes in adolescence and into early adulthood. And I would like to wrap up by thanking uh, the very large ABCD family, uh, the organizers of uh, Repronym, which I think is going to be an invaluable resource for individuals that want to use the ABCD data. And of course, all of you who are participating in Repronym for um, viewing this talk. Uh, my contact information and email were on the first slide of, of this uh, presentation, and I'm sure is also provided via the Repronym resources. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you need a little bit more input or information about the CME measures from uh, ABCD, and I or someone else from the work group uh, who may have expertise on that particular measure will surely reach out. Thank you all uh, for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure chatting. Bye.